Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see so many of you joining us. This is uh, the very first um, in a series of uh, ILTA seminars, the, the first run of, uh, of ILTA seminars. Um, I think we're all we're all kind of agreed that, uh, that that these are very useful. These are going to be very useful for us to uh, to share uh, practice, experience, and, and ideas. Um, and we're delighted to have Tom Farrelly, who is going to give this uh, inaugural presentation. Uh, there is a there is a hashtag. It's uh, hashtag Ilta Talks. Uh, yeah, I've read all of those books. And they're now working as insulation on on the wall. Um, so we're just going to hang on a couple more minutes um, for others to to, to join. Um, just to say that if you have questions for for Tom. During the present during his presentation, if you can type them into the chat box, and uh, myself and Patrick will moderate those, and we'll uh, we'll feed them to Tom at, at the end of uh, his presentation. Um, so, so you're all you're all very welcome. It's great to uh, to see uh, so many people. I think we've over 100 people registered for for uh, for the presentation, um, which augurs well for the seminar series, um, and doesn't put any pressure on the whoever has to go next. Oh, that's us. <laughs> um, yeah, I just mentioned in two weeks, uh, two weeks time, the, the next uh, lunchtime seminar will be from the, from the new ILTA executive. Um, we'll be uh, going over some ideas that we have for ILTA and opening it up to, to others to, uh, to suggest um, ways in which we can move forward together as an organization. But more about that next week. Right. Um, I think without further ado, um, I'm going to invite Tom to uh, to take the floor. The virtual floor, Tom, is now yours. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so just see, will this share screen uh, work well? Uh, so I suppose I'm I'm mindful of the the words of uh, my friend and colleague, or ex-colleague Tony Murphy. We sort of often say like. When somebody was put up on the pedestal, who died and made you king? So I'm very nervous of uh, sort of what words I have to say. I don't know if there's any pairs of wisdom here. Uh, delighted to see uh, Donna's coming in from North Carolina and David, David Passmore in, in Pennsylvania. And he probably killed me for saying it, but my son, who now works in DCU, my son Aidan, I see, is here as well there like that. So that's... Uh, I'm, I'm just thankful and, and Lordy Phipps, but I, I, I get the impression, unlike Donna and David, who will be here to support, Lordy could be here to, to, to be hexing in the background. <laughs> no, you're all very, very welcome. It's great to see so many uh, friends and colleagues from around the community. Um, I agonise when, when I, I mean, I, I was <clears throat> like, uh, often when you're asked to do something, I suppose there was an element of... Um, Oh, it was nice to be asked and then oh my god what am i going to do and then the worst part of it was uh gavin said you could talk about whatever you'd like to talk about in a way but he had sort of mentioned the the blog i wrote um back in in june um about sort of what i sort of i wrote at a time where we reflected on that first six eight weeks of manic manic work that we'd all gone through um and, and the end of the the academic year was 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 upon us and then i was thinking about what's sort of coming up. So I suppose I was kind of going, what did I hope for then? And now sort of two and a half months or so into the new academic year, what then do I hope for? Um, so I'm very mindful of that, as I said, that, that, that there are just a couple of points that I've chosen and, and be interested, I, I've thrown up a question at the end, what do you sort of hope for? So as I said, just as uh, as, as Gavin said, there's, there's uh, ILTA, uh, obviously the, uh, uh, Irish Learning Technology Association uh, Twitter handle, but also then the hashtag ILTA Talks, which will be for all of these seminars. Um, obviously, someone photoshopped that photograph to make me look heavier because everybody knows me. I'm so spelt, and, 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 but obviously somebody got their hands on, on Photoshop editing. So as I said, it's, it's very much about participation and, and, and getting, um, getting involved. And um, so please feel free to, to put the, the, into the chat there is uh, Gavin and Patrick will be moderating and monitoring. Um, I don't want to come across and, and, and be all, all morbid to start with, but I do think we're here because of the pandemic. 
and what has happened across the world. Um, so I just, as I said, just to take some numbers into account, and as I said, I don't want to start off in a dampener, but I think it would be wrong of us not to at least acknowledge where we're at. And as I said, over 55 million cases, sadly over 1.3 million people dead. And in these islands here, uh, almost 55,000 people have died. And as I said, I don't want to become all morbid, but I felt that I wouldn't be doing justice to the situation if I didn't at least uh, acknowledge uh, that. I'll just pause for a second. So may they all rest in peace. Okay, and 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 as I said, move, moving along. But as I said, and hopefully I haven't made made too much of a, a downer about it. But I did just want to acknowledge it. If people would go on to fast.com, and uh, Patrick has set up a set up a poll. Which I'm going to ask you to to the stage. So just do your 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 speed test there for a moment, and and just uh, take that test. So just fast.com to see easier there, and and just sort of what are your download speeds? Okay, so we're going to return back to that and you'll see why, and you can probably guess where I'm going with that. But I did just want to, uh, and get you to do a little bit of work as we're, as we're doing there. So the first thing was, what did I hope for? And so that's, that's the thing there. Now I should start off with a Tom Farley health warning. Oh my God, pivot. If I hear that word again, I could actually scream and I, I thought that photograph pretty much captures how I feel about a lot of that. Um, I think the problem is when you reduce things to one word, it's I feel it runs the risk of oversimplifying things. And dare I say it's sort of trivializing. It reduces everything down to what is a manageable word. And then we, we end up with people sort of embracing that word. And I think those who are further from the ed tech community actually used it far more and more. And I think in many ways, it, it sort of hid the complexities and all of the factors which have impacted in how we as a sector have responded. Um, and I think, well, like in Ireland, um, anybody who knows anything about Ireland, there's an obsession about the terminal second level exam, the, the leaving certificate. Uh, it's raised up to almost a, a, an ultra like status, um, and which wasn't run there this year, and I'm not for one moment passing aspersions on any organization or or any level but in fairness the third level the higher education sector did run exams it ran hundreds of thousands of exams and assessments uh, in in the same period uh, and, and and quietly got on with it and the media did, certainly did not give it the same level of co uh, of coverage but as i said i just wanted to say that thing about pivot i think as we're going to look at here it's far far more complex than that this is, I've taken some quotes from the original blog that I wrote, Pew, Pew, I'm glad it's over. Now, what about September? And the first one was written on the 20th of June. And I had a quote, in, and I do really mean this, that there is often this sort of presentation, and the presentation of COVID as an opportunity. And yes, I, and some of the stuff when I talk about an opportunity later on in what I hope for, it is. But... I like the quote there from Sean Michael Morris there. It's not an opportunity unless it's for, for bringing those communities together. Unless we actually make some real changes out of it, it's just going to be a crisis. Not a crisis with bells and bows, simply a crisis with fallout, with people in being impacted on. And as I said, people being impacted on in terms of shortened contracts, losing jobs, uh, the, the education experience not being what they would have hoped for, 
or what they deserve, assessments not being what they hope or what they deserve there. So I do genuinely, and you, you will see that running throughout this talk, I am generally on the positive side. But as I said, I think this unquestioning this opportunity, I think that is, is, is really going to be a, a, an issue there. The reality is for me, and this is my own quote here, it, and we view, I've heard lots of words where we compared it to x-rays and MRIs and there, but it's shone a light on existing practice and policy. Some of the responses were very, very good. And I would have to say, and I'm sure every one of you there has been out there and seen some really innovative, very insightful, but very well responded uh, endeavors from what people are doing. But some of the responses, and I'm being very polite when I say less, less than effective, in terms of what was actually we call digital teaching. I've heard anecdotally of, of stories ar ar around the country of, of places where people were just using email, just simply responding to, to email and, and calling that online teaching. And as I said, in the same way, I was, I was talking about uh, pivot and reducing things to one word or one term, reducing the stuff there. Um, calling this. There's obviously a, a, an outbreak of COVID there where, where in Waterford there with Tony Murphy having his mask on. But as I said there, that, that's what said, and, and that's the thing there, we need to look at ourselves honestly and acknowledge what was done well and what wasn't done well. And if it wasn't done well, or why, what were those issues? What were the things which have been stopping them? Which would the things have been impacting on how we actually do our job and how colleges are doing our job? Because, and particularly now, and I don't know if people get a sense of it now, particularly in light of, of uh, news of the vaccine and people hopefully looking forward to a better future at some stage next year, that this idea of the online is a, is, is a deficit model. And somehow we're just treading water until the real thing comes back. We'll do okay for the moment, but when we get back, it'll be the real thing. And I'm starting to get a sense that that's creeping in and, and, and it may creep in as more as it was seen rather than seeing it as having merit in its own right, that it's actually, it's not something there that, that is, it's just a stopgap that will do just, because the problem with it is when we have a default system where everything is predicated around, you know, a real campus. And I love this quote here from Hodges et al. Face-to-face, -face, there's a big long quote, but basically face-to-face -face education isn't successful because lecturing is good. It's because the whole thing is there you know, we've, we've talked about, and I've used the expression myself, the BLE is the campus, but is it the campus? And I have to ask myself, is it not? Because the, 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 the on-campus experience works because all of the other stuff that's there, the student support service, you need to drop into admissions there. Like at the moment, you know, you know, and for a long time, you email someone in administration or somewhere like that, or some other colleague, and you may get a holding email Due to COVID restrictions, I'm unable, I'm away from my desk, I'm not work. Now, I'm not giving out or anything there like that, but I'm simply saying that level of removedness. So if we talk about why is the face-to-face, -face, and you could actually say we are face-to-face, -face. I can see your face and you can see mine, so maybe we do need another term. But the thing about it is, it's a success because we're physically on that space. And all of the things which make up, college is not just about what you do sitting in the class. In many ways, you could argue that's probably the easiest part to replicate. It's all of the other aspects. So if we're serious about making online education a real uh, and viable uh, entity in its own right, having its own merit, we need to think about how, how we actually spend our money. And talking about spending money there, I just these are all stock photographs, by the way. They're all creative comments, so you hopefully see the attribution there. But how much do you pay for a real experience? A small building, um, you know, as I said, talking to my good friend in Waterford there, Ken McCarthy there, like he said, even a small building can cost 10 million euro. And then you kit it out and all of those things there. How many Zoom licenses will you buy for 10 million euro? How many other attributes will you buy for a virtual campus with 10 million? So the thing is, like, we're not comparing like with like. So if we're going to actually make, as I said, the, the, the online entity, a real and valuable uh, experience where the online is your campus, we need to think about how we're going to, how we're going to build it and what's that going to, going to look like. I finished up when I was talking there about the pedagogy of care and as I said, particularly as I said, the, uh, 
I, 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 I like some of the quotes and um, there was a, a great book published there in, in, in April, May, June, uh, Aris Butz Kurt, and there's a, it's, it's a load of, of case studies from uh, around the world. But as I said, what is about, and for me, it was about the, the listening to students, and particularly marginalised and disadvantaged students. And that's the problem. I mean, I said about shining a light. I'm, I'm sure we're, we've all... Um, the, if you look at the way, you know, COVID has, 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 has actually the, 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 the figures, the people who have done the worst out of it are disproportionately from the lower socioeconomic groups, by and large, and those marginalised. And those people who suffered the most of COVID are those people with less structured housing tenure with with poorer quality well, I, I i'm the first to say i'm living here in a nice house in the west of ireland with rubbish broadband but apart from that i physically don't have to share a, a, a house with a load of people i'm not living in some large communal setting there like that so all of those things those compounded effects there uh, and as i said so we need to think about we need to consider i suppose i'm making the argument we should have always considered uh, our students but if we didn't do it before, we should certainly do it. What is actually at the other end? When I see the photograph, what is, is happening in your ward? So I figured, as, as I said, I think for me, that, that sort of pedagogy of care was the important thing there. And I, I followed up the following week then, as I said, the pedagogy is underpinned by my contention. Nothing fancy is required. Above all, it's about doing the basic things right and not making unrealistic demands on ourselves and our students. And that's the thing there. I, I spoke about the 90-10 rule, and I genuinely do mean this. I would, and I've said this for a long, long time, um, I would be happy if 90% of staff use 10% of the existing technologies. It's not about making someone feel, oh, what do you mean you haven't heard Gwango? That app has been out for two days. You know, it's about sort of using our stuff and, and, and using it to the best of our, our, our ability or something that we can make that is sustainable and then we can actually make make work without making people feeling inadequate or they can't 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 achieve something that's that's doable for them i had some and this is taken from, from the, the 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 blog as i said it's not itself a pedagogy it's the technology is simply just the technology it's how you're going to use it and when people are at a distance that thing about communication is at the heart of the problem we need to we need to communicate those expectations to everybody and expectations from from management and senior management and that's the thing like like as i think as i said like we often are faced with not just my own college which is around the country there we have to understand that not everybody is familiar with with, with the technology that we use our senior managers you know when the senior managers, when they were last teaching, would, were virtual learning environments a big part of their working environment. Everybody has to have a clear understanding and expectation of what they can do and what the technology can do. Because I think, I, I, I said, that, going back to that thing about the pivot, being setting up unrealistic demands or, or and oversimplification, what happens is we, we take and we, we adopt certain words and they suddenly, oh, we'll zoom this, we'll do this, we'll do that. We need to understand the limitations of the technology and what are we asking of our students. And if it's not your job, it has to be someone else, or it has to be someone's. It does have to be someone. That's the thing where we're actually forcing ourselves to do all sorts of things there. Like that the, historically, there's often been divisions between computer service and educational services, and there's sometimes, but the thing is, people fall in the cracks. And if they fell in the cracks when there was standard teaching, they're really going to fall in the cracks. With us now. we're all sitting here we we have you know the, the college now is you it is in effect maybe 300 or 400 campuses so who does that person go to what's the minimum standard to aim for for everyone and that might seem overly reductionist but as i said going back to my 9010 i would say let's have a consideration that we, we, pedagogy of care is about say we will commit to at least doing this the clearly structured need to follow content. Once again, that's not about technology. Put stuff in folders, as Darren said. I hope that people take that more. And universal design. I, I Best quote I ever heard about universal design. Universal design has nothing to do with disability. Universal design is simply good design, period. Nothing to do with this marginalization of it there like that. And the other thing I said that I have good quality asynchronous teaching in our rush. And we're here on Zoom now this morning. But as I said, like, you know, going back to, 
I, I've been teaching now for years online and have obviously been ramped up with this. We have more stops of starch and stuff and poor, poor broadband and stuff like that. So we need to just think about what does uh, pedagogy of care look it, It's about doing the simple things and the simple things right. That's what they were the things I was hoping for. That's, you know, that, that, that was hope would come out. On a shame with plug for Gosta Goes Global, if you haven't seen the uh, five minute talk, uh, by Maha Bali, who I, I'm a huge fan of. She started off and, and, and in her talk, she said, nobody signed up for this. And she's right, nobody has signed up for it. And she posed another question, and this is at the height of it all, in, back in, in mid-April. Do you even know what day it is? Because we've all been in that situation there where, I don't know, I, I'd remind you that, Philip, this is Tuesday, it must be Belgium or something. This, But this idea where things all start running one into the other. And if you are at the, if you're hanging on by your fingernails, you're not going to provide a good service to, to people. So, you, you know, it starts with sort of considering others, considering yourself and standing over something then that, that you can do. So that's what I hoped for. What do I hope for now going forward? Uh, look, this is, is going to be as long as a piece of string and as contentious because there'll be people thinking, and I just sort of picked three areas that, are dear to my heart uh, and I think are, are, are real live issues for people. Um, but, uh, and I'm, I'm going to be throwing up a question, what, what do you hope for? And as I said, I'm not watching any of the chat, but hopefully people are sort of uh, chucking things in and we'll be, we'll be thinking about that. First big one for me, open practices. If ever there was an opportunity, if we ever, you know, we've been talking about open practices here, whether it's pedagogy, publishing, OERs, open science, open admission, if ever there was a time to really buy into the whole thing, I mean, this is our opportunity. And it, for me, it's not just a philosophical thing. I think it's, it, it, it's going to have a real impact on the pound, shillings and pence in terms of, of money there. For people who aren't as overly familiar, uh, I hope, I don't, know if, I don't know if the person is even registered today or even here, and I hope uh, she doesn't mind me giving her a shout out. If you haven't read this piece, anybody who wants to get their head around open practices, Catherine Cronin, uh, our book there. And uh, because her, her the, the journal uh, Erodal was an open source creative commons, I took the liberty of downloading the paper and throwing it into a word art. Uh, so that's what I came out. And not surprisingly, open came up. But I do think if you haven't got your head around what openness means in a real sense, and what really, I do think, as I said, it's, it's your opportunity to, to get. So I do think openness here. The National Forum, um, the thing that the document oh, uh, supporting um, open education, it identifies, yes, there are certainly um, enablers. I think policies and strategies and culture are really, are, are really important that they're going to make a big impact on, on what to do. But the thing I really want to get into is the inhibitors, and they actually recognise themselves that what the, the, the inhibitors are, are the diametric opposition of what the enablers are. I said that it's shone a light on teaching practice. It's shone a light on everything that we do, whether it's policies or not, lack of institutional policies and a commitment to open education. Not one of these buy one, get one free, serial packet philosophy. I mean a genuine, what does open education really mean, Lee? Because I think if we're not careful for all the nice platitudes and mission statements that institutions come out with, we need to look at how we do our business and genuinely do our business. How do you enact those policies? Another shameful plug here, but it's not a plug because as I said, he didn't ask me to do it. Um, but the guide to enabling policies, because I'm while I'm making a case here for openness, I hate to see it presented as a self-evident good that everybody will inherently buy into. It should stand up on its own two feet because I do think it's the right thing to do, but we need to think about how it's actually going to happen. And I just took a few things out. There's a few things here and I asked those questions. Well, under what conditions can digital material be made open access? Will the HEIs commit to support open access to all teaching and learning material on the VLE for all staff? And how can we... Uh, how can the lectures be reassured? Because that's the, the issue there. Are people, are they going to be happy that the stuff is going to be made? Are they going to buy into that? Is the, are the institutions going to buy into that? I'd, I'd love to sort of 
do a, an analysis. So I'm throwing it out there, looking for anybody who wants to get involved in doing a crowdsourced piece of research, but do an analysis of job adverts in academia, uh, whether it's education technology or, 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 or lecturing positions. How many of them really give a commitment that if you're going to get promotion, if you're going to get tenure, that we're really going to value open education, that we're really going, what's your commitment? So are you going to get more credit for publishing in a closed access journal read by, you know, three men and his dog, so to speak, or you've produced a, an open access YouTube video, which has been viewed 10,000 times. When push comes to shove, what are the institutions, what's the, the sector really going to value? I said here, it's not just about being nice or, 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 or you know, if you don't want to do it just for, for those reasons there, but we could also say it's money, higher education institutions are spending billions for access to stuff written by their own staff. And as I said, like, I, I mean, like I had a, a recent situation there. It's really shone a light on, like, I wanted to, to, to get an open, uh, or, well, not an open, I, I'm using, probably stretching the word here, open. Um, the college will have to pay for it, but it should be available to our students. And uh, it, they can actually buy an individual license for about 35, 40 euro. But if we actually want to buy it as an institution, they're charging hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, for, for, for licenses. So colleges should really look about having more repositories and encouraging, genuinely encouraging and supporting their staff to actually make contributions to producing OERs, to producing publications. And as I said, if we've never done it before, we really need to do it now. The next one there is assessment, a very, very thorny issue here. Um, and I think we should really use this as an opportunity. Now I'm just throwing up e-portfolio. There's lots of, there's lots of alternative assessments here like that. So I'm not, I only just threw this one up because I thought it, it, it was a nice, it was a nice picture and a shout out for e-portfolio Ireland. I see Lisa Donaldson uh, uh, and some of the other um, friends on e-portfolio. I don't know if Orn is here or not, but I just want to give a shout out for alternative ways of, of assessment there, because this is our opportunity to do those things. Because the problem is, when push comes to shove, are we just, what are we trying to do? Are we just trying to replicate? We're just trying to do, oh, if we only we could do exams. So what we'll do is we'll try and make exams as real as possible. We'll replicate stuff as much as we can possibly do it to make it, to make it look like a real exam. And that, that is, the real issue, rather than actually embracing it. And we'll try and do that and make it look real. And one of the big things here, proctoring. So we're basically what we're saying, we don't actually trust students at all. And I think and I think we could do a whole session just about privacy and proctoring. Uh, but just for me to say, what am I hoping for? I'm hoping that we don't just try to replicate and just do what, what the real exams are, what the real type of assessments uh, and I think, as I said, this for me is raising some real alarm bells, so I hope you don't take on that. Conrad Hugh, the new paper just out there, an opportunity to break away from some of the content. Heavy. Look, that's, you know, if you ask me what am I hoping for, I'm hoping that we use the, the, the fallout from COVID-19 to change the situation for real genuine assessment. And the minute that the lockdowns are, are, are over, that we don't just rush everybody back into our, our, our exams, our exam hall. The third thing, and as I said, and as I said, you can, I'm open to loads of other stuff, but obviously digital access, because this is how we're all, we're all logging in. And I'm looking forward to getting the results of the poll now in a few minutes here. Um, but as I said, like the, 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 the study there recently there, this, this is just a picture of, of, of CIT. Almost one third of students at St. Angeles uh, College in Sligo um, reported poor broadband, 29% of IT Sligo. 22.7% in water and so on and so forth. All of these things about poor broadband access. And uh, so as I said, like, that, I, I finished my doctorate in 2009 and looking at virtual learning environments. And I was talking about the next generation digital broadband plan. And yet we still have people here with, with very, very intermittent uh, broadband. So we can have all of the fancy stuff here. Like there was there's the, the funding here for, for uh, to help colleges deal with, with COVID and also then giving this, the students all of those new computers then. But the problem is, is that I can give somebody a, an iCore uh, i7 or i5 chip, lovely, lovely laptop. 
but as I said, if, if the if the the broadband coming into the house where they're living is not very very useful, it's not going. It's really going to have a real impact. So I hope that, as I said, we 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 make some real efforts now, and and that'll be the first thing. And I hope I'm not coming across as I think broadband is the only part of the digital divide. There are a whole a range of socio-economic things. But I just thought, just talking to Patrick Coyley, I thought it was a lovely image yesterday. Uh, sort of like talking about, you know, planning your interior design and your, your, your furniture for your house and there's a big roof, and there's a big hole up in the roof. So I think that's, that's the thing. We need to get some stuff sorted out uh, in, in terms of how we're going to, 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 to change how we actually access uh, our, our uh, virtual learning environments or digital campuses, so to speak. I, I ran this this morning. I have 16 megabytes of download and three megabytes of upload. And I think when people, I, I've been reading a lot of stuff about, should your students have video, have, should they have their videos on or videos off? Well, I don't, uh, I asked my, one of my classes, I, 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 one of my classes, there's 23 in the class, and I asked them to, to tell me where they live and to tell me their upload and their download broadband speed. The lowest was 3.3 .3 download and the highest was 17.6. That was the best. And the average for my class was 6.8 megabytes was the average. So how the hell am I going to insist? Oh, you must have your camera on. Camera on, they're barely getting in there. Some of them are in shared accommodation, shared, you know, so, I think, you know, going back to my thing about my hope for, you know, pedagogy of care, how all that, that looks there. Patrick, have you, are you able to bring up the results of the, uh, the, the, the survey? I just want to see, I want to really feel bad about seeing what, what sort of range of, of uh, speeds that, that all of the, uh, the people watching in this morning. And as I said, because a lot of that does go back, as I said, the, those on lower income are less able to afford good broadband. I had a student there last year and it really exposed the whole thing that, that they had particularly relied, they came into college, they didn't have broadband and they didn't have a, a, a half decent quality laptop. The laptop they had at best, you could be described as a glorified word processor um, because it's, it's, its functionality was so limited. So their ability to take part in, in my classes was severely circumscribed down to connectivity and socioeconomic factors there. So unless we take a, a real leap of faith in, 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 in making the digital divide. So I don't know if Patrick's able to bring up the results or if you bring it up later on. And I don't know. Patrick, are you there? It should be available as uh, in the chat to everyone perfect. there. Oh, perfect. That's, oh. that's, that's fine there like that. That's, that's fine. Yeah, it's there as a screenshot. Okay. So, um, So, well, see, I'm I'm still so bad with Zoom. I'm trying to bring up the chat, and I'm trying to. Uh, my apologies for this. No. Um, but can you could just give us the, the overall figures there? Just um, um, over the, half of us are at forty nine megabytes or below. No. Um, we have of the current group that we have here, we have uh, twelve who are below nine megabytes, nine megabytes yeah. and below. So, and then yeah. so so because I said like it's 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 a reality then across uh, across the country. Oh, cheers! Perfect. There we go. There. So as I said, like that. The, I mean, like, even the, the, the mid range as well, there are a good range of people there. There was certainly, I mean, a not inconsequential 26% uh, of people are 19 meg and below, which as I said, um, and 19% are, are, are nine and below. So all of this talk about, and I think, you know, we need to, to and that's where, you know, you can see where my whole idea of, there's real issues to be, to, to be addressed in terms of, what what I what I particularly what I particularly hope for like I suppose that was the the the, the thing there. So you know in, in talking here like my hopes as I said for me is was that we use this as an opportunity. But as I said, and I did put in that note of caution, it's only an opportunity if we make real meaningful changes. We need to 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 embrace and I think the overarching thing for me is a hope for a pedagogy of care. And what does that pedagogy of care look like? It looks like having appropriate policies. It looks like having appropriate infrastructure. It looks like a pro having appropriate targeted funding. 
um, uh, it looks like having appropriate training to help people take, take advantage of all of this. And it needs everybody to buy in, to, to really embrace and to really offer genuine alternatives. So I suppose that, that, that's what for me the hope is. Uh, another shameless plug, um, come January the 1st, I hope all goes well for Munster Technological University. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, so as I said, uh, apologies to leave, but uh, uh, as I said, I'm going to take some, some advantage uh, of, of, of having a captive body. So I suppose then I, in the chat there, and we'll be talking about what do you hope for? And I know people have been talking about that uh, for, to, to, to some degree there like that. So I, we, we'll open up the chat after that. So just very, very finally then, I'll just finish up with a quote from me, which I think sums up the whole times about how we're, how, how we're getting on with things at the moment. It's from Seamus Heaney. The way we are living, timorous or bold, will have been our life. And thanks to Ilta for this kind of invitation. Tom, thank you very much. Uh, really enjoyed that. Uh, as I expected to, um, and I think you've you've reflected well, and you've you've really uh, touched on a lot of uh, a lot of those areas, a lot of the issues that, 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 that people are grappling with, uh, people are, are feeling. Um, so I've I've asked for questions. Um, so I'm looking through now. The, there was there was a lot of uh, conversation in the in the ch in the chat box. A lot of comments being made. So I'm just going to pick up on some of those uh, now, Tom, and they're, they're not all questions. Um, there was some chat around email and the efficacy of using email. And some people were saying it's 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 worked and it's worked in the past. Um, thanks to Catherine Cronin, who has posted a, a number of links around open practice. So they're all they're all available to everybody. Um, but she was on, so uh, <laughs> I didn't know she was on. Thanks, Catherine. <laughs> Um, Donna Lanclos pointed out that in the US, lecturers cannot be assured that recorded communication in class, class won't be used against them by politicians who object to what they are teaching. It's pretty frightening stuff. Uh, Right-wing activists are already targeting academics based on what they learn from course catalogues. Um, Owen O'Dell says that proctoring is the work of the devil. Um, and all I said that embracing alternative types of assessment sounds great, but in a semester when uh, she's treading water, the time needed to create these is her, is her particular issue, uh, which, is a, which is a great point. Um, Laurie Phipps says it's not just the assessment, we need to, to rethink the marking and feedback. We can't just suggest things that double the workload of lecturers. Um, so now I'm going to look into the there were all the com there were the comments that I picked out there. And apologies to anybody if I if I missed a comment. Um, lots of lots of great feedback, Tom. Lots of people saying thanks and, and well done. I'm trying to find any uh, any questions in here. I, I just picked up on one there about the structural changes MTU will 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 face. Yeah, uh, I suppose. Well, first of all, we have two different VLEs. Uh, they have canvas and we have blackboard. Um, uh, although I must uh, I say I do actually quite like the look of canvas, but that's another day's a day's walk there. Um, I'm under no illusions that uh, there's going to be changes. I mean, we look at TU Dublin, and they're like literally we're in the same county, and and there's issues there. Um, I think there's going to be stuff around. I, I, with any new college, I don't think it's just MTU is the is the structural governance changes. But I do think with, with the right commitment, and if we talk about the COVID and opening up those opportunities. Um, in theory, if you even just take the two counties, um, we're going to stretch from Bally David sticking out in the Atlantic, out in the West Coast, to 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 y'all on the East Coast and 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 or, sorry on the east of, of Cork. We're going to have a, a huge area, even just serving those two counties. And I do think you know that it does provide us with great opportunities. I was lucky enough to go over to University of Highlands and Islands in January, and I've seen what, what they can do. But, and I'm not, I'm not naive enough to think that they themselves don't face challenges. But I do think we do have an opportunity for people in remote areas. And the same thing with any of the new, the new universities uh, uh, to, to, to come on board, uh, yourself up in Sligo as well, that um, it's not, we do have the opportunity that people can genuinely get a meaningful third level education uh, and i think we're going to get some 
dare you hate using that word synergy, but we've come together and, and the greater than the sum of the parts that students will be able to get a far wider range of courses, far better resource. Because the one thing I do hope is that if the if the if if the government really has this idea of uh, technological universities, particularly in the regions, they have to be prepared to fund it. And that means centres out in remote areas that people, going back to my thing about broadband and connectivity and hardware. Um, so yes, I, I, I'm, I'm probably not answering the question. I've been too long in Kerry. I'm, I'm, <laughs> um, but I do see it as more of an opportunity. There will be structural changes, but I think we'll have uh, economies of scale and I think there's a great commitment and passion to, to bring that level of education in, in remote areas. Thanks, Tom. Um, Brian Mulligan has asked, what will we do that is, is different? Uh, I think, Brian, is that in relation to, to use? Um, what we do that's different or what should we do or what I hope we do? I mean, I suppose that's the thing I'm going to temper with. What, what do I hope? um will be different i hope uh i uh, i think i hope policies will be different and real meaningful policies which will support people which will you know go back to thing or just say take openness as a as a, as a, a real thing um i think we need to create and we are creating repositories and stuff there but i think we need to create more mechanisms and more support uh, a genuine commitment that makes openness part of what we do, a real part of what we do, and you get reward for doing those things and acknowledgement that you get that you get those things. I thought that's one thing I would hope that we would do. So, so that I think we hope you would do that differently. I hope that we'd have a seriously meaningful uh, broadband strategy. As I said, I was teaching students there yesterday afternoon, and some of the stuff that I was planning just couldn't be done. Simply couldn't be done because half my students just don't have the technological capabilities of doing it. So I thought there's some of the things I hope will happen. Absolutely, yeah. Um, again, just picking up on, on comments. Um, yeah, David Crowley says, the idea of centers across the region is a great idea, it ties into the innovation uh, e-hubs. Uh, here's a question from, from Laurie. Uh, you, you talked about the importance of open, but is that in conflict with the vendor-driven systems we use? Uh, absolutely, and I think that's, that, 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 is, that is the problem, um, because we have very, very powerful vested interests, and make no mistake, it's an even this on the, on the publishing front, um, that, that, as I said, we, we have a great system uh, with publishing. I mean, if you think about it, you get a builder in, and uh, uh, they build a wall for you in front of the wall and then they come in and ask you for 2,000 euro and you say, no, sir, no, sir, you shall pay me 2,000 euro. But what I will do is I'll put a sign up saying that Tom Farley built this. It, 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 you wouldn't do it in any other, other industry. So colleges pay for, for the pay the vendor, but they've already paid their lecturer to, to write the paper. They pay their lecturer to review the papers. So as I said, like, I, I, that's where it's going back there. Now, I am glad and I'm delighted to see the, the Plan S with the, the European Commission. Uh, and I think that, that, that commitment. But um, yeah, look, there's, there's, there's vested interest. So, sorry, and I'm probably talking la 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 at this stage because they're not going to just they're not going to just go away. Um, I haven't got an answer for that. Sorry. Uh, so that's probably. Yeah, I think where where we can we we I think the publishing is probably the handiest one to take on, in that sense. Uh, so that that would be good. See you, Ken McCarthy. I see he's just gone there. Um, so um, I think it's the easiest one, and you start taking it off. But that's going back there about policies. Then, so every time you do stuff, if you if you actually made a requirement that all of your staff all publish in open access, and I don't mean this gold open access, because what I have seen is that. Uh, a lot of people are putting in for funding and they're now putting in uh, a fee of two and a half thousand in their funding. So in order to fulfill Plan S, yes, you've, you've made it open access, but you've used public money to pay for open access. But if you had a situation where uh, uh, open access publishing, genuine real open access publishing was rewarded and acknowledged in higher education institutions, I'd like to think that a lot of the for fee publishing 
would would wither or at least be far less attractive to people. But as I said, the other stuff there, the VLEs and all, I, I don't know. I think that's there's a few battles to be to, to be played out, yes. Okay. Um so just picking up on that um uh, following on from that question from, from Laurie, um Brian says, why can't open work with commercial? YouTube is the most popular e-learning tool for students. And uh, Catherine um, Cronin says, vendor or open is not binary. Um, movement towards open is possible and necessary. Yep. Um, and then Laurie says that he doesn't disagree, but I think we have to keep asking the questions and looking at vendors critically, uh, for example, ensuring ethical alignment. Yeah, I think that, agree with that. Yeah, I, I think yeah, it's it, it, it's it's slowly pushing back and asking those hard questions there. Can I ask everybody here? I mean, I, I put out the, the the three areas I was talking about. Can everybody just type in in one or two words one thing that you hope for? Is assessment going to be the main real and permanent change. I would like to hope so that assessment is going to be the real uh, and permanent change, but. Um, yeah, because I think if assessment changes, marking changes, teaching changes, a vaccine soon, yes. Public sector funding. Yeah. Changing how the SAT and H interact. Yeah, I think that's all connected to my again. Create or develop BLEs. Yeah. Less higher ed, more vocational. Digital assessment to focus one plus one option. Second good for direct. Yeah, I think as I said, that's that's um I, I think the the they're starting to blur now around the level QQI level six. Um so I think that's the, the thing there. Um the asynchronous pathways. I think as I said, I think we need to, to, to see more. Um this is actually it's actually quite hard. And you see when you're teaching a, a class how you're actually trying to to follow their better understanding of tell as more low cost option. Yeah, I think that's as I said, like we 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 bought into this high end high tech stuff. And as I said, if if nothing else, the lower tech stuff is uh, like that call I said about the asynchronous that you know, as I said, a, a good well structured discussion board uh, activity or a reading activity opens up a lot of things there like that, and it doesn't require high end uh, high speed broadband connectivity. So I think those those things there would would certainly be, and I think also then, particularly for those in the FE sector who don't have the same things, the the resources to be able to draw upon, I think that would be um, uh, a thing I'd like to see. Fourth class now that someone's really going back in the back in the, in in the day like that. That's Laurie. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um. I, I and I, my hope is Brian Mulligan learns a few new tunes. Um, so. <laughs> no, no smile from him. He's turning away. He wasn't happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> Second class, the new class. Fourth class. Okay. Um, I'm I'm just kind of mindful. We're almost at the two hours, so yeah. um, I think if anybody else, I'm. I'm yeah, I think unless there are any other uh, qu questions for, for, for Tom, um, kind of conscious that we're heading to two o'clock. And we'll probably I just have... see someone there about Teams will team will do the VLE landscape. Yeah, I think uh, Teams has certainly crept in um, uh, and it seems to have, have certainly become a big part of what a lot of colleagues are doing. I'm not necessarily, I'm always happy with necessarily with Microsoft Teams. Um, but that's another day's work, um, and when the recording is knocked off. Um, and the reconfiguring work transport sustainable community. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I really do hope things will be different. Things may be different, but if they're not, they may not be necessarily better. And I think that's what I said. And, and if we haven't really used this, this pandemic, this crisis as, as an opportunity, to genuinely pull together and genuinely change. And rather than we don't have to end up in an echo chamber, us just talking to each other in the ed tech community, because you know, for all of us who are in the ed tech community, there's lots of staff out there who are not, who are, are, are really struggling themselves. And um, 
were never particularly adept beforehand. And hopefully they've come out of it stronger, and a bit more resilient about and appreciating the opportunities afforded by education technology, not that they're literally just treading water until the real teaching starts again. That is my fear. I've talked about my hopes, but that is my fear that that people will say, yeah, we, we wait and come September next year and I'll be back in my class again. Uh, and hopefully people will say, what am I, I mean, you know, if you think about it, I've been able to attend webinars and stuff all the way around the world all this year. I've been able to teach classes and stuff there like that. So um, I, I'm not saying people aren't craving for some sort of interaction, but I think, you know, if we can use this as a genuine opportunity, not just, as I said, deficit treading water till September. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point, Tom. Um, a great point probably to finish on. Uh, and I think we're all very hopeful for, for, for positive change in, in, in that. So look, my thanks again to you, Tom. Uh, I think it's a, it's a fantastic first uh, seminar and uh, it's great to see so many people participating in, in the chat and, and, um, and, uh, and, and joining us for this, for this first seminar. So thanks to Tom and thanks to everybody for, uh, for, their, for their comments in, in the chat box. This um, presentation has been recorded. It will be on the uh, ILTA website. Um, say two weeks from now, um, the ILTA exec will, will come on and talk about some, some ideas that we have for moving forward. And, and also just a final reminder that the um, our winter conference, the Inter or EdTech Online winter conference is on the 14th and 15th of January. Core Papers is out. Um, so we look forward to, to, to that event and to welcoming your, your papers and welcoming people to that event in January. Uh, okay, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again, Tom. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Patrick. And thanks to everybody else.